Legal battle begins on Monday, the 8th of May, as Presidential Election Court Tribunal hears petitions from aggrieved parties. And the Africa Media Development Foundation says Nigeria has the highest recorded violations of press freedom. Tonight, in commemoration of press, uh, War Press Freedom Day, we address challenges faced by journalists in the line of duty. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Cohn. The Presidential Election Petitions Court has fixed Monday for the hearing of the petitions challenging the declaration of the All Progressive Congress's standard bearer, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, as president-elect. With this development, the expected legal battle by candidates disputing the outcome of the 2023 presidential polls will commence from May 8. The chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Mahmoud Yakubu, had on March 1 declared Tinubu the president-elect on the grounds that his party scored the major of the majority of the votes cast in the polls. The former Lagos state governor had polled 8.8 million to defeat Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, who scored 6.9 million, and Peter Obi of the Labour Party, that also amassed 6.1 million and 15 others. Now, dissatisfied with the results, Atiku and Obi filed separate petitions seeking orders to annul the elections or declare them the winner of the polls. Well, joining us to discuss this and more is Right Honourable John Gall Labour. He's the immediate past speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly. And also joining us is Professor Richard Aduche Nwokocha. He is the professor, uh, professor of Law at the River State University in Port Hacker. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us and good evening. Thank you very much. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. All right, I, I'm going to start by looking at what happened and transpired during the elections and after the elections. Um, what INEC consistently said was go to court. Now, the time is nigh for all to go to court. And uh, many people are saying that this will um, be a very critical um, point in Nigeria's election history. But this is not the first time that people have gone to court. And the, the last elections, the uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar also went to court to challenge, um, you know, the votes uh, cast on election day and saying that he originally had won the elections. But we all know uh, the outcome of that tribunal. It's not our place to preempt it. But I'm going to start with you, um, John Gall. Um, what do you make of all that transpired during the election and after that? Well, I think it is an election that is uh, basically one driven by too much expectation. I may say too much of expectation by the electorate. INEC has spent a lot of time trying to educate the electorate as to why this election will be the best, most transparent election. I give the impression that this election will be uh, conducted in real time and results will be uploaded in time. And so you could see that the anxiety of the public, the electorate of Thai, uh, well by the obedient movement got a lot of uh, voters who were, who were not interested usually in voting in the election, who came out for particularly the new and the young people. And so with what happened at the election, and even following that with the INEX chairman's uh, speech at Chatham House about uh, the role of technology in the election, people have tried to INEX that credibility before the election. So Nigerians were hoping for such an election. But what happened at the election is that, starting with first, the poor deployment of the fever system, and then the fact that results were not uploaded, and the fact that even the, uh, some of the results that were uploaded were uploaded, some of them the week after the election, you know, has left a lot of worry and concern by Nigeria. And so when you see the petitions in court, you know, even though I next to support, it is actually part of the election cycle. That first, there's a pre election cycle, there's actual election uh, process, which is the voting, and finally, there's post election, which is uh, election person. So, it's the right of all the candidates, you know, to go on after post election to go to court. So, I think that what has happened now is that a lot of Nigerians are so much hope behind it after the election, there's a lot of disappointment. 
When you say Nigerians have a lot of hope in INEC, um, talking about that hope, that INEC had built up the expectations, just as you said, uh, for Nigerians with the introduction of, um, you know, the um, transmission of results, which ov obviously fell face flat uh, during this election. Um, and the it, it, it's more like what we ordered and what we got. Billions and billions were earmarked for this elections, and what Nigerians expected is not what they got. Now, you're saying that the hope has now been moved to the tribunal, but if this is what we got in the elections, who's to say um, that there's anything left to call hope? Um, from what will come from the tribunal. And I'm asking this because you and the professor obviously are lawyers, and there has been some sort of trust deficit when it comes to the judiciary in this country. Um, so what's the, sh what's the shred of hope that's left for the average Nigerian to hold on to uh, in um, preparation for the tribunal's hearings? Okay, so I, I think the fact is that uh, we, you have to see with every case based on the circumstance of the case and the fact. So the fact and the circumstance of the case is that um, Nigeria is sustained by the process adopted by INEC. You have a first aside, for instance, the first instance that the INEC chairman in his presentation at Chatham House stated clearly that the result of the election will be transmitted in real time after collision. And that uh, the pooling and the returning of staff were going to transmit that result. That didn't happen. The elections were not transferred in some cases, seven days after. If you check the, the the IRS system, you will, you will see that the picture of loaded and depressing polling. The people living in my own polling, my result was transmitted almost what after the presidential election. Now that happened all across. So a lot of the uh, presiding officers who had passed to us, they were not, they, they were not working. They, they were unable to transmit work. They were unable to transmit. And they were unable to transmit as well. So that is the first aspect. The second aspect is that all across, it was very obvious that from what happened subsequently, in the presidential election, in the governorship election, the situation was different. You find the square result was transmitted at that point. So Nigeria says and satisfied with the process of this election. The field shot in, and the field that, you know, um, INEC did not um, have this be determined by the process in which the election was adopted. When the electoral body is the one telling you to vote for, I mean, it's, uh, it's like they are not even ready to look at, okay, this is the sum of the issue. Because the electoral act, and giving an exit uh, power under Section 136 to review some of the results of the election in terms of synchronization. And so, from the complaint we had from the coalition center, from PDP and the APC agents, and remember, you know, Milai and Mikai Hedder had complained, and then we from the Labour Party, and the fact that they didn't let it, you know that this election is, uh, is headed, uh, is marred by chaos, uh, intellectual chaos, and the fact that what I next transmitted uh, were results that were manually committed. Um, and then uh, transmitted one week. You cannot have the results of the presidential election in the hands of agents and for, and for three, four days after the election would have been announced at the polling meeting and transmitted. So that has brought a lot of issues and pressure on the judiciary. Unfortunately, most of the decisions we can see before the judiciary, it, it's not even much more about, it's, no, it's not as much as possible about challenging the results of the election. It's about challenging the past, whether I next or to have transmitted the results at the collection center or at the polling unit, or whether it was trans not transmitted once or two, whether the candidate who contested the election is to run the election. You have not seen a substantial challenge in, in, in terms of the polling unit by polling unit and transfer and transfer results because the loss of the electorate and the political parties do not believe that even those collation accreditation was compromised at polling. So once you have a data system generated by INEC, to meet the result they have already declared. It gives you very little chance in terms of uh, challenging the election in terms of statistics of what happened at the election. It's more about what ought to have happened before the election, who was not qualified to run the election, who did not get 35%, whether the guidelines the electoral act provide for uh, transition of uh, the result announced at the polling unit, or whether INEC and then INEC now come in to say, no, we are not applied. The chairman has not started the election that they are not applied. To do transmission of that at that point, and that they can rely on the political resources. So, okay. the big challenge, and the tribunal is set uh, to not be the front of the city of INEC uh, to comply with the Let me come to you, Professor Wakocha. Um, 
the National Legal Advisor of the All Progressive Congress, who most of these petitions are against, um, had ag agreed and confirmed about uh, confirmed the date. I beg your pardon uh, for this um, tribunal to start. But there's something that he said that I want to, um, you know, push you on. He did say that yes, they have been briefed on, you know, the hearing um, which they are ready for to defend the mandate of, of course, the president-elect. But then he did say um, that. Who told you, I'm quoting him, that the election petitions at the tribunal must necessarily be concluded uh, before May 29? So let's look at it. Uh, what the law says in terms of these petitions and when the timeline for which it should run for, um, as opposed to what this man has said, uh, help us to have some clarity. How long is this tribunal supposed to last? And of course, many have also questioned the, how sacrosanct May 29 is in terms of swearing in the president-elect? Um, I think uh, May 29 is a matter of law. It's sacrosanct. Um, the, the mandate of the outgoing president will elapse on that date. And it's expected that the incoming president will take oath on that date and begin his own mandate. Um, swearing in has nothing to do with um, electoral contests and uh, petition uh, activities. Uh, what governs that is the law. And uh, Section 285 of uh, the Constitution states clearly the time that is allowed the tribunal to handle these matters. Subsection 10 of that section says the tribunal must give its judgment within 180 days from the date of the petition. Um, so they have 180 days. That is the law uh, within which to finish. Um, it has nothing to do with whether it will be before or after um, the date for swearing in. No. And the fact that the person is sworn in does not put him beyond the reach of the tribunal. The tribunal judgment uh, will determine what the legal position of the parties to the election uh, really is. So it does not matter whether it ends before or after swearing in. But swearing in is a completely different matter. The mandate of the tribunal is 180 days, after which appeal must be concluded within 60 days of the filing of the appeal. So I, I do not think um, they are directly related, and uh, it will be expecting too much and expecting outside the law uh, for anybody to expect that the tribunal must conclude the case before May 29. May 29 is about 27 days from now. It's almost impossible. Uh, let's talk about the petitioners, the PDP and, of course, um, the Labour Party. Now, so, some of the arguments that we've heard, obviously, I'm sure that you've heard, uh, is about the FCT. The FCT has been a subject of the argument and, of course, the, mm -hmm. the, the number of votes that you're supposed to have that should qualify you as winner um, normally in every election. That has been uh, the bone of contention here. Let's break that down again legally and what the Constitution say or the Electoral Act says about the number of votes that you need to have, including that of the FCT and the role that the FCT plays in all of this. Section 134, um, subsection, um, section 134, yes, subsection uh, 4B makes that provision defining the scope uh, the scope of the territory of Nigeria that a winner must win to be qualified to be declared winner where there are where there are um, um, a number at least two political parties contesting or more than one candidate contesting and uh, it says he should win one quarter of the votes in each each of at least two-thirds of the states, all, all the states of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the Federal Capital Territory. Now, I have watched with uh, interest uh, the much argument that has uh, been thrown up over that provision. The court is to determine, I agree completely, uh, but, but I, I think I honestly find some of them absurd. Uh, the Constitution is, in my opinion, referring to the scope of the area you must win, besides winning the highest number of votes. Now, there are three rules of interpretation. I am sure the court will deal with all this. There is the golden rule 
by which the thing is taken uh, from its natural meaning, the way it's presented. If that does not help you in reaching a position that is conclusion, conclusive and clear, you have the literal rule. Take the letters by their English meanings and try to make sense out of it. And if you do that and it still doesn't solve the problem because it's still capable of two interpretations, the last option is the mischief rule. The mischief rule requires you to look at the problem that you are trying to solve, the, the problem that the legislature was trying to solve at the time the law was made. And what could have been the problem that the Nigerian National Assembly was trying to solve when that provision was made? Because that provision is different from the provision in the 19, uh, 1979 Constitution. The mischief that occurred and what happened differently that must have led to the necessity to include the federal capital territory is that under 1979 constitution, you did not have a federal capital territory that was not part of a state. Lagos was the capital. Lagos was a state. So if you say to third of all the states, you have covered the entire territory of Nigeria. But under the 1999 constitution, Nigeria now comprises 36 states and a federal capital territory, which is not part of any state. So unless you mean that the votes in Abuja are not to be counted, then you must include Abuja when you are talking of the territory that must be, um, that the size of the territory that the winner must win. And I think that is where, for me, as much as in Abuja, is that Abuja emerged under the 1999 constitution. It did not exist as an extraterritorial part of Nigeria. But under the 1999 constitution, Abuja had a come into existence as a federal capital territory that is not part of any state. And that provision simply intended to gather in the votes of Abuja as part of the at least two-thirds of the territories of Nigeria that is to be won. But again, as I said, this is uh, an issue that the court will uh, pronounce on eventually. I can see no reason for the um, opinion that has been canvassed on that issue. First, election is a leveler. Democracy does not admit of, of uh, unequal votes. All votes are equal. All territories are equal. So... So you cannot, in the same vein, say that there is one territory that must be won. What of the 36 states? The Constitution does not require you to win any particular state. It says you must win one quarter of the votes in at least two-thirds hmm. of the states hmm. of the entire country. So it simply means you count Abuja as a 37th territory within Nigeria. And there is a section of the Constitution, uh, remember the exact section, that I, say, I think it's in the interpretation section, that says... That for purposes of constitution, Abuja is to be treated like a state. Okay. So if that is the case, it simply means it's not a total of 36, which will give you 24 states. You need to win more than 24 states. You must win at least 25 states because there is an additional territory which makes Nigeria a 37 territory structure. Huh. I think that clearly is what uh, uh, the constitution means. Okay. But uh, again, as I said, uh, these are matters that the court will eventually have to decide. All right. Let me come back to you, John. Um, the issue of interim government has been bounced around by a couple of people. Um, many have said, I mean, even the Labour Party has asked that governments, you know, prosecute and security agencies, um, you know, get these people who are proponents of, you know, the issue of interim government. What do you think, you know, um, may these proponents come up with this idea? Why, why do you think they decided to toe this line? Well, I think, I think clearly uh, the fundamental reason why they toe that line is the fact of, uh, fact of denial that the declaration of the president about the uh, Atulajan was done in accordance with the law or that he actually emerged in our It depends from the fact that uh, the opposition party for the party who were acting for the entire national government believed that he did not win the election. He ought not to have been declared by INEC. And um, like Professor Mofuka said, um, an attempt to say uh, delay May 29, let nobody be born in on the result of the election. That's the fundamental basis. But like he has already said, 
may be denied the formality that has been because it's already provided by, by law uh, that, and by practice that may be denied the ceremonial handover to the incoming president. The law does not want any vacuum that the focus. That's why may be denied to provide it. Period of time provided for election petition is there as a buffer to ensure that if he doesn't win the election, the cost of the power to declare the winner of the election, issue another uh, mandate annex to issue another certificate of election to any candidate who has a merit. Now, the reason why this has happened was because of the fact that uh, a lot of people felt very agreed that the confidence that INEC uh, uh, boosted with before the election, what they were expecting. Uh, before the election did not happen at the end. Let me explain for that. I think Nigerians were guilty of uh, a very poor perspective drawing. I never buy high fast and so I began the impression, or maybe social media as well, not just I next, social media, political parties, were naive in interpreting and understanding the provisions of the electoral act. I can tell you, as a politician, as a member of the political party, a lot of the Agents and leaders of the political party did not even understand the provisions of the electoral act. We got the, we were given the impression that we are doing an uh, electronic voting system. Nigeria is not, does not have an electronic voting system. The 2022 electoral act as amended does not provide for electronic voting system. It only provides for electronic accreditation system, which is not even real fact. That after the acquisition, the numbers are transmitted. That after the election, the picture of the results are the polling units to be transmitted. So it's still a manual election. So the impression, the wrong perspective drawing that created by INEX social media way over zealous political parties without the proper understanding of the steps of the election, that we had the manual election by the to electoral act. The only difference in that election is that there is a, a technology called the DVAS from which your data, your thumbprint can be captured. What is it captured? It seems, it seems that capturing is still manual, but through the system, which we need to be manual. The result of the election, the election is still conducted manual. It does that the result at the polling unit, instead of taking the result of the information set as the only source of transmitting the result, we now snap that result and transmit it. So if they manipulate the result, they will transfer the manipulated result. If they manipulate the diverse system, they will transfer the manipulated diverse system. Nigeria saw the impression that this was the reverse, it was an electronic system, it was an electronic transmission, it was transmitted in real time. And so when the results came, and then INEX delayed that transmission for whatever reason, and people did not trust this live transmission of the diverse acquisition at the top of it, that is the that INEX did not comply with the terms of the law. And then they don't want um, to have um, someone that still did not win the election this morning. Into office, and that's why the call for entire national government. My conclusion on the matter is that I, I believe that even the security agencies and the government authorities who were laying credit and over emphasizing the company, look, an agitation by a group of people should not be given legitimacy by a collective conclusion uh, by the public that this is what we ought to see. The group has been that section about this is true. Is there any process, is there any provision under the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria or any of the statutes of the law of the Constitution of Nigeria that requires for an interim government? Yes, no. Mm. That makes it sense to ensure that we do not have a, a vacuum in, in, in that office of the president. A person who has been declared the winner of elections will be sworn in as president of May 29th. Across the state, the House of Assembly, the Senate, and the National Assembly, their petitions will still remain in force. So, I believe. Maybe longer than the year where they are in office. If the court determines that they were not properly elected, another certificate of return will be issued to the This is the education we need to give to our people. And then finally, the education of the fact that we did not this electoral act is not an uh, electronic voting system. Even the accreditation is not even electronic. So people got the impression, and even this is why the issue of you did not transmit the results real time. I so at, at the end of the day, what we are transmitting is still the result of the manual election to map at the polling unit and transmit it. Hmm. So this issue, this is we've got a wrong piece. Just, so, just like so, I said at the opening, we are so towards the government. Okay. We, 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 we accepted without reading the implication of the act, and now a lot of our supporters believe that what what the act is. That is why they are calling for a military national government. I have just one minute, uh, Professor Walker. Let's see if you can do justice to that one minute. 
All of these blames and finger pointing mostly points at INEC with all the monies that we, you know, voted to make sure that these elections came out better than ever. But then some, so many would say that these elections have dragged us back into the dark ages. Do you, who's going to be questioning INEC? Who's going to probe for, the, for accountability uh, and for a better INEC? Do you see this happening anytime soon? If you leave it to uh, government, government uh, most of the time is beneficiary of whatever um, you are complaining about. So I think what a responsible and uh, proactive people will do is prepare to campaign for extension of reforms in the electoral system to ensure that we get to the point they thought we were at when this election was held. Um, at a point, I even also got away with that impression that uh, uh, we were heading towards an electronic vote. But if you look at the law, just as uh, uh, John also said, uh, on the John, you will find that it is a manual election. What is guaranteed is electronic accreditation, part electronic and part manual, because you will still take the register. Mm. So I think it's based... Uh, the entire hard feeling is based on the interpretation of the law, as John pointed out. And uh, I think that what we need to do is stop the blame game, okay. uh, go on with our, our petitions, and then strive to demand more reform in the electoral sector All to right. ensure that we get to the point that we deserve. Well, I guess that's the way to go. Right, Honorable John Goldlabel is the immediate past speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly. And Professor Richard Aduche Wokacha is the professor of law at the River State University in Port Hackett, River State. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for speaking with us. We appreciate it. Great Thank pleasure. Thank you. Well, up next, we turn our attention to press freedom and issues affecting journalists globally. Stay with us.